because also we make heavenly investments. I give to missions every month. We give our tithe every month. We give offerings every month. We're investing in eternity. We're laying up that treasure in heaven. Those are things that we do. I don't wait to the end of the month to make that investment. We make that investment as soon as we get any money. That's the first thing we do. That's the first bill we pay is give our tithe, our offerings, our missions to God. But what we're doing is we're making a wise investment in eternal things. And it seems like the more you give to God, the more he blesses. No, you can't outgive God. If you're struggling today, let me ask you, are you tithing? If you're struggling today, let me ask you, are you giving to missions? Hmm? We have a missions program in our church. I mean, in Philippians it says, my God shall supply all your need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. Wonderful verse, but they gave to missions. <laughs> they invested in eternity. They invested in God's plan, and God said, I'm going to invest in you. You invested in my work, now I'm going to invest in you. That's how God works. God's looking to invest in those who are making an investment in eternity, making those eternal investments. So point number one, the introduction here, thriftiness is a basis of wise stewardship. That right there is the word stewardship. A steward. So the teaching of stewardship provides understanding of thriftiness or how to save money, how to set money aside, how to use money wisely. That's based upon this idea of stewardship. S-T-E-W-A-R-D-S-H-I-P, stewardship. The Greek word for this identifies one who manages the property of his master or the property of another. His faithfulness is determined by how prosperous he becomes and the use and increase of the resources under his care. And so a steward is someone who takes care of the property of someone else. Okay? So in other words, if I have money, this is not my money, about 18,000 shillings or so. This is not mine. Whose is this? Huh? Who gives us the ability to make wealth? Who gives us the strength that we have? Who's the creator of everything? I'm a steward of this. Hmm? I'm supposed to use it wisely to make wise investments so I can do more for the one who it belongs to. You know, People on Wall Street, you know, in um, different um, investment firms, other people give them money that they invest, and they reap the benefits off of the investments. God gives us money that we invest, and we can reap the rewards, spiritual and physical, hmm? if we do it wisely, if we see it as an opportunity, huh? But many times you say, well, it's just 18,000 shillings. What can that do? Well, if I have 18,000 shillings, 1,800 belongs to God to tithe. Hmm? And what can that do? Well, that can print some gospel tracts. It can help someone to hear the message of salvation and someone can get saved. Hmm? Yeah. Oh, that can be an eternal investment. What can that do? It can help to pay for electricity in the church building so that people come, the lights can be on, the fans can be on, they can sit down and listen to the word of God being preached, and someone can get saved. What can 1,800 shillings do? Well, it can buy several pieces of paper, some of which you're holding in your hand, so you have a lesson you can take home to study later that can make an investment in your life and in the lives of others. Huh? It's a tool that can be used for the glory of God to fulfill the Great Commission. It can help us to see people get saved. It helps us to fill up the water, the baptistry with water. I mean, the water company charges money. Can you believe that? They even make churches pay for water. We have to have money to do that. And so as I give my tithe, no matter what the amount is, it's a wise investment fulfilling the Great Commission, helping the church to do the work of God and I made an investment in eternity. And as I am faithful to God, God is faithful. Now, God is faithful, isn't he? So as I keep the promises of God, God keeps his promises to me. And God keeps providing and providing 
and provide it. Now, if you don't understand that, it's because you're not doing it. Because God is good what? God is good all the time. Yeah. We have a wonderful God. We have a gracious God. But we need to understand everything belongs to him. And I'm to be that faithful steward. The importance of thriftiness. Look here, point number two. When we meet the Lord at the end of our lives, he'll give us an evaluation of our thriftiness. Evaluation, E-V-A-L-U-A-T-I-O-N. In other words, he's going to judge us. He's going to evaluate us of how we lived our life. Not for salvation, but how we served him. With what God has given to you, your talents, your treasure, whatever it might be. The abilities that you have, have you used them for the glory of God? Hmm? The time that God has given you, have you used your time wisely for God? The money that God has given to you, have you used that money and invested some of that in the work of God? And so God's going to judge our works, not for salvation, but for that reward. Okay? And you can say, well, God, I don't have much. Well, he didn't say you had to have much to serve him. You've been faithful with that which is little, and now God's going to reward you, and now you'll have much one day. Uh -huh. But first, we have to be faithful with whatever God has given to us. Are you getting me? That's what the Bible talks about. That's what the Bible teaches us about this idea about thriftiness, about how we're supposed to be, and the importance of it. Because God will evaluate us. You know, in Matthew chapter 25, verse 21, we read that. He said unto him, well done, thou good and what? Faithful servant. Thou hast been faithful over what? Many things? A what? A few things. It doesn't matter how much God has given you. What matters is are you faithful with what God has given you? And all of us can make excuses. You know what happens when you get more money? You get more bills. It just works that way sometimes. Because then you say, well, I want this, I want that, and you start spending more money, you start desiring more things, and your bills go up. You say, now I can send my kids to Green Hill Academy. Now I can do this, now I can do what. And your bills come up. You'll never have enough money. You know that? If you're waiting to have enough money to serve God, you'll never have enough. If you're waiting until there's no problems before you start tithing, you'll never start tithing. Hmm? It's, just, it's just not going to happen. Okay? By the way, Satan knows that also. God says that he can rebuke the devourer for your sakes, but first you have to be faithful. Hmm? Faithfulness always comes first when it comes to God. We must be faithful. And God is saying here, You've been faithful over a few things. I will make thee ruler over many things. Uh -huh. Requirements of stewardship. Let's look here at point three. Requirements of stewardship. Point number three. Now going to heaven is not achieved by our good works. We're not saved by works. It's a gift of God to those who cry out to him for salvation. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. It's by faith and grace. Through for by grace are you saved through faith. But when a believer enters heaven, it will be commended on the basis of our stewardship. Our reward will depend upon what we've done for Christ. Therefore, the account that Jesus gave of the three stewards is important to us as well. Look there in Matthew chapter 25, verse 14. Look back up to verse 14. Look back up to verse 14. We'll read through the story for a moment here. For the kingdom of heaven is as a man traveling into a far country who called his own servants and delivered unto them his goods. And unto every one he gave five talents, to another two. And unto one he gave five talents, and to another two, and to another one. To every man according to his several ability, and straightway took his journey. Now notice here he gave different talents, didn't he? He didn't give them all the same. They're different. Just like all of us in this room are different. We have different talents, different abilities, maybe different jobs, different incomes. There's different things that are there. Okay, and even this is of the Lord. It's God who does these things. Verse 16, 
Then he that had received the five talents went and traded with the same and made them other five talents. And likewise, he that had received two, he also gained other two. So the one that gained five, he, received, he, he gained five more. The one that gained, got two, he gained two more. But he that had received one went and digged in the earth and hid his Lord's money. After a long time, the Lord of those servants cometh and reckoneth with them. Hmm. And so he that received five talents came and brought other five talents, saying, Lord, thou deliverest unto me five talents. Behold, I have gained beside them five talents more. His Lord said unto him, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Thou hast been faithful over a few things. I make thee rule over many things. Enter thou to the joy of thy Lord. And so this uh, servant had gone, and he'd been given five talents. He went out and gained five more. And God said he was well pleased. Verse 22. He also that had received two talents came and said, Lord, thou deliverest unto me two talents. Behold, I have gained two other talents beside them. His Lord said unto him, Well done, good and faithful servant. Thou hast been faithful over a few things. I'll make thee rule over many things. Enter thou into the joy of thy Lord. Notice the response for both of them was the same. One had received five talents, he brought back five more. One had received two talents, he brought back two more. He didn't bring back five, the other one brought back five. He brought back two. Did God condemn him? Well, this one brought five, you only brought two. No, he did well. They both increased by 100%, okay? And so when you look at it numerically that way, or percentage-wise, they both did the same job. One had more than the other, but God said, you're both the same. Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Okay? See, God is not looking at the amount that you have. He's looking at how you use what you have. Okay? He didn't demand the one that had two to bring five. That might be an unrealistic expectation. Maybe that not be fair of God. But God says, I'm going to treat you all fairly. I'm going to treat you all equally. I'm going to treat you all the same. You have more talents. This is what I expect of you. You have less talents, but I still expect 100% out of you. I still expect the same dedication. I still expect the same faithfulness as I do out of the other one. You may not produce the same amount, but you have less, but you still produce 100%. Okay? But now, we come down to the last one. Verse 24. Then he which had received the one talent came and said, Lord... I knew thee that thou art an hard man, reaping where thou hast not sown, and gathering where thou hast not strong. And I was what? Afraid. I was afraid. And went and hid the talent, thy talent in the earth. Lo, there thou hast, that is thine. But God, I was afraid because how, how am I going to pay my rent and how am I going to pay my school fees and how am I going to pay my bills and how is this going to happen? And I didn't have much, so, so I, I, I couldn't do I couldn't do what the other ones could do because I had less. Did God understand? Verse 26, his Lord answered and said unto him, Thou wicked and slothful servant, thou knewest that I reap where I have strowed not, sowed not, and gather where I have not strowed, strong. Thou oughtest therefore to put my money to the exchangers, then at my coming I should have received mine own with usury. And also he called him wicked servant, and also he took away that which he had. And I think it takes more faith sometimes when you're that servant who has one talent. <laughs> it's like you have to trust God even more, it seems like. And that's true in life, isn't it? It's like it seems like the more you have, the the less you feel like you need God. Mm -hmm. Less people trust the Lord. But it seems like when you have less, it seems like there's that fear sometimes. But God has the same expectation of every one of us to give 100%. To do our best, to do our all, to be faithful to Him. No matter how much or how little it might be. That's true with our talents. You might say, well, I can't sing like some people. I can't speak like some people. I can't, well, Moses even told God, Lord, 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 I, I, I can't speak too good. But God said, you're still going to serve me. Hmm? I mean, the Apostle Paul, three times asked for God to remove that physical problem that he had. And God said, no, he had a physical problem. And God greatly used the Apostle Paul. 
it's not our physical problems many times that limits us, it's ourselves. It's us not having that faith in God as we should. It's not us giving a 100% as we ought to. It's obvious that the first two servants understood and practiced the principles of faith, thriftiness. They used as few funds as possible, maybe for their own needs, but then used their resources as much as possible to bring some greater returns. Saving. My wife always, um, anytime I go home, I have coins. She always takes them. And she saves them. And it's amazing how much you can save when you put your coins aside. But when you only have 200 shillings or 500 shillings, and I'll just buy a chapati, I'll just buy this, I'll buy that. But, you know, I don't always need to buy stuff all the time. It's good to set aside, even if it's coins. You say, what is, what is a few coins? You save up your coins at the end of the year, you might have 50,000 or more. Hmm? It's amazing how much coins can add up. Uh, but many times we just think it's not much, and so we spend whatever we have. We don't save. We don't use it. Hmm? How thriftiness differs from stinginess. Look here, point number four. Point number four. Thriftiness is using as few resources as possible for my own needs so that I'll have greater resources for generosity to God and others. So using as few resources as possible and use that for generosity to God and others. That word blank for generosity is a bit small, sorry about that. Using as few resources as possible for my own needs so that I will have greater resources for generosity to God and others. Stentiness is keeping back what should be given to others so that I'll have more for myself. God condemns that. That word is condemns. That next one. Next blank there is condemns. God condemns that type of thing. And by the way, you know it's very easy for people to do, Pastor Charles? Someone who has less might come to you, for example, and maybe you can't help them for whatever reason, and they'll look bad at you, not knowing what you've done for others, not knowing maybe you've helped other people with school fees, not knowing maybe you've helped other people with medical, not knowing you've helped other people maybe with rent or other things, and I don't know that he has, I'm just, he's on the front row, I'm using him as an example. <laughs> and so I might come to him with a need and he may not help me with my need, and I might go away thinking, well, he's stingy, he's selfish, he doesn't care for anybody. Yet maybe in our church, maybe he helps people more than anyone does. Right? So be careful about judging others, because if he has the ability to help me, and if God wants him to help me, and if he doesn't help me, then he doesn't have a problem with me, he has a problem with who? With God. And God will hold him accountable if he doesn't help me or someone else that God wants him to help. Is that true? Oh, yeah. That's why normally what I do, I try to always pray about what God would have me to do. I have set ways I do things, set things I pray about. There's set ways that I have done things over the years. There's been some people that I've helped over the years that they don't know who helped them. There's times I hand somebody, somebody something directly. There's times that we'll do something through the church. Depends on what God would have us to do. But I always seek the Lord in prayer. I always seek what God would have us to do when it comes to helping others. And there's times we've done more than I thought we could do. There's times I wanted to help people when God said no. And who does everything belong to? God. We need to follow God's leading we need to follow God's direction. I was talking to a man one time, and he has uh, several children, and he talked about his daughter's married, and her and her husband had several children, and they're having some financial problems, and he and his wife had the ability to help his own daughter. And they wanted to help her, but they felt like the Lord said no. Now, that young couple is going through a very trying time in their life. But it's a time where God is at work in their life. And God did a great work in their life during that time. 
And if the father had stepped in, the physical father, he might have hindered the work of their heavenly father. We do need to be sensitive to the leading of the Holy Spirit in how we do things. Otherwise, instead of looking to God, you might just start looking to one person. God does not want me focused on Pastor Charles as in, this is my help, this is my comfort, this is my shield. No, that's God. Huh? And I try to be careful with that. I've had some people in the past where it's like every week they're running to me and I'm like, whoa, I'm not that person in your life. I'm not God. You need to go to the Lord. You need to pray and seek God and what God would have you to do. I'm not your first answer. Your first plea is to God. Now, it might seem flattering to some, but I want people to look to God, not to man. That's what we ought to be doing. And we ought to be planning for what we do. And so thriftiness is important. Planning is important. Um, let's look at some aspects of thriftiness here, point number five. Thriftiness begins by being content with the basics. Being content with the basics. The person who believes that happiness is measured in things will struggle. In Luke chapter 12, verse 15, the book of Luke chapter 12, verse 15, the book of Luke chapter 12, verse 15, so you will use up valuable resources for things that do not profit or satisfy if you don't learn about contentment. Luke 12, 15, and he said unto them, take heed and beware of what? Covetousness. For a man's life consisteth not in the abundance of the things which he possesseth. Uh, not about what you have. Okay? Now, there's nothing wrong with having things. But those things are temporal. They don't last forever. There's nothing wrong with having different things in life. But the problem is when you put your desire for those things above God. Huh? There's no problems if you have good things, but you tithe, you give your offerings, you do things as you should, you're planning for the future, and God can bless you. That's true. Matter of fact, the one that had five talents got five more. He had invested more. He received more. The one two talents got two more. He invested more, he received up to that amount. Sometimes others might have more than what I have. Sometimes might have less than what I have. But God's going to judge me according to what others do or don't have. He's going to judge me according to what I do with what he's given to me. Each one of us will be judged according to that. Generosity is being content with the basic essentials of life. The Bible says in having food and raiment, let us be there with content. You know, we can be content, but you know what we have also? We have a loving, heavenly Father. We have a God who loves us. We have a God who cares for us. We have a God who can provide for us. Okay? And it's amazing how good our God is. Point number B, thriftiness is using creativity to increase assets. Using creativity to increase assets. Point number B, to increase assets. Jesus as a faithful steward, uh, just as a faithful steward doubled their assets, so Jacob found creative ways to multiply the flocks, flocks that were trusted to them. If you study about the life of Jacob, his father-in-law changed his wages several times. His father-in-law was unjust to him. But Joseph, Jacob knew how things worked. He set up this rod, and they were born on that rod, and they came out a certain color. <laughs> and he figured out how to use some things to his advantage. They said, oh, he shouldn't have done that. Well, his father-in-law shouldn't have deceived him, given him a different wife. His father-in-law shouldn't have done those other things either. And he didn't cheat, he didn't steal, he didn't rob. But he had some wisdom in how he did some things. A thrifty man will understand how God designs things to work and use this knowledge to increase productivity. You can increase productivity. Understanding how things work, okay? You need to have that understanding, Point number C, thriftiness is protecting assets by putting up with irritations. Protecting. 
Thriftiness is protecting assets. Assets is what you have. Life is filled with irritations and conditions that are less than ideal. But we can put up with temporary displeasure for a moment. I like it in Proverbs 14, 14, it says, Where no oxen are, the crib is clean, but much increases by the strength of the ox. Now there's times they'll come down to our property down here, and they'll see paper here and trash there and things here and things there. And in a way I'm thankful because I know we have like a lot of people in our school, things are going good. But on the other hand, I'm not thankful because people are throwing trash on the ground. <laughs> okay. And we have trash cans. All right. And so, even though that's a sign that there's people here, that shouldn't be the proper sign, okay, that there's trash on the ground. That's a lack of character. But what's going to happen when you have many people, toilets are going to break, handle on the toilet's going to break, the inside of the toilet's going to break, the toilet seat thing's going to break, um, light bulbs are going to have problems, light switches are going to have problems, things are going to wear out faster, okay, and it's going to be messy, the, I mean, we don't have everything painted. We don't have everything done right now because we're still growing. We're still doing things. There's building supplies here. There's building materials there. Well, we stack them up. We make them nice, but it's not perfect the way we might want it to be, but it's still okay, you know. But let's make sure that we don't use that as an excuse just to allow a mess to be there, all right. And for church members, for all of us, in church, one of the things even when we have special days, um, or even if I gave out candy right now. If I had a bag of candy up here, I'd give everybody a piece of candy. You know, we'd have to go around and pick up pan candy wrappers off the floor. And there's no children in the room. Okay, there's just two babies back there. But besides that, <laughs> okay. And yet I know some people just, okay, don't be that way. All right. That's not a sign of, oh, there's many people here. That's just bad manners. That's bad character, okay? Learn to do things properly. But sometimes there's going to be challenges, all right? And that's all right. That's no problem. Um, we see point number E, and point number D. Thriftiness is having only those personal possessions that are functional. Functional. F-U-N-C-T-I-O-N-A-L. You know, there's, something I've see, there's things I've seen sometimes, and I thought, man, that's nice. Man, that's good. Oh, I like that. And then my next thought is, but I don't really need it. What am I going to do with it? I don't have to have it. I mean, but there's a part of you that wants it. You see something that looks really neat. Especially guys, some new gadget, some tool, something, whatever you like. Ladies, you have your things that you like and you think, wow. But do I really need it? Huh? Do I really need 15 of the same tool? Do ladies really need, you know, a purse for every day of the month? I don't know they might. I mean, do I really need to have this thing? Is it really that functional? Is it really necessary? Is it really needed? Okay. I don't need to buy it just because I might have the money at that moment to buy it. All right. Um, is it something that's functional? Is it something that is needed? Jesus will give some examples of thriftiness. Um, even in Luke chapter 9, Verse 3, when he told the disciples to go out, he said unto them, Take nothing for your journeys, neither staves, nor scrip, nor bread, neither money, neither have you two coats. And what about the apostle Paul in Philippians chapter 3 and verse 7? Look over in Philippians chapter 3, verses 7 and 8. Look over there for just a moment. Philippians chapter 3, verses 7 and 8. And point number D here. That blank was the word functional. Philippians 3, 7. But what things were gained to me? Now remember, the Apostle Paul, a Pharisee, a leader, lifting up money, position, power, authority. What things were gained to me? Look what he said. Here in Philippians chapter 3, verse 7. For what things were gained to me? Those I counted loss for Christ. Yea, doubtless, and I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of what things? All things. And to count them but dung that I may win Christ. After Paul gets saved, you don't hear about his family. You know that? He had a mom and dad. I don't know if they're alive or not. But he left their religion. They must have been people of some prominence to provide the best school for him. 
He had Roman citizenship. Maybe they did also. Huh? He was born into a certain life, a good life. He left it. He left everything. He turned his back on his family. He turned his back on his co-workers. He turned his back on everyone and everything that had helped him before. And he said, I counted as nothing that I might win Christ. He said, the work I'm doing here is the most important work. That doesn't mean that he didn't love them. But so many times we stop serving God because of things or because of people, because of position, authority, whatever it might be. He said, I'll let nothing hold me back. Point number E, thriftiness is making offers rather than asking for quotes. Point number E, thriftiness is making offers rather than asking for quotes. Making offers rather than asking for quotes. I did this recently. There's somebody who's going to be doing some things, and I'll share this in the next hour. But um, I made an offer several months ago. I said, hey, if this doesn't work out, let me know. Don't sell it. Don't do this. You call me. We'll take it. And I'll tell you about that next service hour, what God is going to be doing for us, I think. But I made an offer. <laughs> Before I was even on the market, I said, we'll have it. We'll take it. Not going to wait. The wisdom that God gave Solomon included the ability to gain and retain riches. Um, Solomon provides a significant example with King Hiram. Um, Solomon wanted to get some lumber, some timber. And so what he did, he went and reminded this king that had the seed of this timber that he needed. He reminded him about the friendship that his father David had with him. He renewed that friendship of his father. And then he said, this is what I want. And I'll provide the labor. Labor costs a lot of money. That can be 20% of the whole thing, 25%. And Solomon made an offer and even said he'll provide the laborers to do the work to get a lower price. Not only that, but he also told him the importance of the work that's going to be for the house of the Lord, all these different things. That's the second Chronicles. We're not looking there right now. Look at point number F. Thriftiness is gathering up the fragments after a project. That blank is the word fragments. Thriftiness is gathering up the fragments after a project. Thriftiness is gathering up the fragments. Now, Matthew chapter 14, verse 20. Remember when Jesus fed the 5,000? Huh? Look here. And they did all eat and were filled, and they took up with the fragments that remained 12 baskets full. Jesus didn't just let it go to waste. He gathered it up. If you come back here, you'll see piles of timber over there, piles of timbers over here. I don't like them being there, but we're saving the fragments. Why? Because we have more work to do. We're not going to just throw stuff away. We have people come all the time, Pastor Charles, can I have this? You don't need this? I mean, you have so much, you don't need it. Yes, we do. We're going to do some more work. We don't have it to just give away right now. I mean, we have it for work. We've invested this. We bought this. People sacrificed money for this. And we're going to keep using it as long as we can to get the work of God done. And, well, these are just fragments. This is worthless. You know what's amazing to me? Pastor Charles, I ask people this all the time. People say, well, Pastor, this is no good. You don't need it. Can I have it? Well, if it's no good, why do you want it? <laughs> you know, why are you keeping it, Pastor? Because I see value in it, which is why you want it, too, <laughs> because you see value in it, you know. And so we try to be thrifty. We try to save as we do the work of God. Thriftiness is saving during times of plenty. Thriftiness is saving during times of plenty. Think about Joseph. Remember Joseph as he's there in Egypt and he interpreted Pharaoh's dream and he talked about the famine to come. They saved back and God gave them seven prosperous years. And they saved back like 20% from those years and that provided for the time where there was no food. That provided for the time of drought. So when God blesses you through more, don't just go spend it. Set it aside for a little while. One of our pastors was here some years ago, and they talked about how God gave him some unexpected money that came in to him and his wife. They weren't expecting some money that came in, and <clears throat> he was like, man, this is great. Well, let me see what I can buy. Then he thought, well, wait a minute. Why has God given this to me? And he said, before we buy some things we've been wanting, let's wait and see why God gave this to us to begin with. And just like a month later, they got a big bill that was unexpected, and the amounts were almost the same. 
and the money that God had provided in advance, they used that to pay the unexpected bill that came in. Hmm? It's amazing how God can provide. Don't just use the resources. You get extra. Don't just go out and spend it. Save it. Wait until you know what God would have you to do with it. Let's look on here. Point number six. Three requirements for thriftiness. Faithful in little things. Faithful in little things. Faithful in the use of money. Okay? And faithful in that which belongs to another person, which is stewardship. So those two blanks were faithful in little things, faithful in the use of money. That's on the back page of your notes there. John Wesley once said, earn all you can, save all you can, give all you can. C.H. Spurgeon said this, he said, a fool may make money, but it needs a wise man to spend it, or a wise person. Thriftiness is a way of life for those who enjoy the rewards of giving. Sometimes we're not able to give because we spend it all on ourselves. It's good to be able to help others or to give to the work of God. Thriftiness is a personal discipline of those who are striving for the greatest rewards. Thriftiness is a skill of trading things of lesser value for things of greater value. Thriftiness is the foundation of every generous deed. A man's treatment of money is the most decisive test of his character, how he makes it and how he spends it. I like this last one here by Hudson Taylor. He said, God's work done in God's way will never lack God's supply. He is too wise, that is, God is too wise, a God to frustrate his purposes with lack of funds. And he can just as easily supply ahead of time as afterwards, and he much prefers doing so. In other words, if it's God's work, God can provide. And God does provide. It's amazing how God can provide. God knows our heart. God knows our motives. God knows what we're doing. But it's, us to, it's up to us to wisely use that which God has given to us. And again, remember our verse here. His Lord said unto him, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. That's been faithful over a what? Few things. Not based upon how much you have is based upon whatever God has given to you. I will make thee ruler over many things, and unto thou the joy of the Lord. One had five, one had two, but they were just as much honored by God. God recognized both of them equally because both of them were faithful in whatever they had. It was different amounts, but both of them were just as faithful as the other. And God blessed them according to their faithfulness. Just like God will bless you according to your faithfulness, it doesn't matter how much abilities you have, it doesn't matter the finances you have, but how you use them for God. That's what makes a difference, is our faithfulness to Him. Let us pray. Dear Father, we love you. We thank you for this lesson today, Lord. I pray that you'll bless us, give us understanding according to these things. I pray, Lord, that you'll be with the um, request that I mentioned um, earlier in our lesson time, Lord, with the college students and others who are sick, with those who are uh, meaning the school fees, Lord, that you'll provide for them. And with each of the requests that we're given, Lord, I pray that you'll bless each one of them. Bless the morning um, preaching hours to come. And thank you, love, in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to take our break, and we'll have our morning service here in just a short time.